uh, good morning. <coughs> I'd like to thank Ravi and friends for giving me the opportunity to come and uh, participate and learn from others. Um, Dr. Madhukar, very veteran guru of all of us. So good to see you again, sir. Mr. Ved Prakash, <coughs> colleagues like uh, Praveer Jha, who are, in my opinion, right people to talk about tomorrow because they've changed yesterday into today and they are about to change today into tomorrow. So it's a privilege to be here with us. <coughs> when we have a topic like preparing for tomorrow or about tomorrow, the first thing that I notice people talk about is VUCA. It's such a ghisa pita cliche that the VUCA word has actually lost its meaning. So I will actually not talk about VUCA because at the end of the day, changes have always happened. <coughs> right from industrial revolution days to the industrialization, to the liberalization, you name it and changes happen. So <coughs> talking about volatility and uncertainty is actually a cliche. What I would like to focus on <coughs> is that what transformation is happening right now affecting all of us in almost uh, immediate present and how it's going to really change the way we manage our business in the future. And then a conference like this would be a good opportunity at least for people like me to learn how to deal with it. All of us are experts at reading about what changes happened. What do we do about it? <coughs> so I'd like to put my thoughts together in three sections uh, and I call it three S. Uh, first is look at the speed of change that is happening. And that's significant because the speed has accelerated. We must pay attention to what impact it is having on the change itself and the impact the change is having on the organization and individuals. Second S would be on the suddenness. Things are happening so suddenly that sometimes we are actually taken off guard. We're not prepared for sudden changes to happen and it suddenly stares at us. I'd like to talk about that because the lack of preparedness or anticipating that is one of the skills that HR community will have to really hone up on how to anticipate and that means learning about business. And the last S is about security of job. There's been so much halla gulla about people will lose jobs, robots will take over, AI will replace everything. Uh, so I like to talk about speed first. If you see the speed of uh, technological change, two things have happened. Technology has become cheaper. I spent a good part of my career in Motorola. In the 70, in the 1980s, a chip, a semiconductor, a high-speed semiconductor, those days high-speed was different than today's high-speed, was something that you know, 150,000 US dollar. In exactly 19 years, the cost came down to 35 dollars. Two decades but from 150,000 to 35 dollars. Now when the cost goes down, the spread of technology increases. You see the cell phone, uh, we're so happy that almost everybody, everybody can afford the technology and use it. So the speed, the speed has increased because cost has gone down and the application of uh, technology has made meaning to almost every sphere that we are attached with. And because of that wide application, it is not only IT or technological companies that are affected, and there is a mis notion, misconception that only big multinationals or large corporations, Indian houses, are affected by this. It is affecting even small scale and medium scale industries. And we can have a lot of examples. For example, if you, yesterday I was reading somewhere that in a flood affected area in China, 3D printing was done on housing and I saw a whole uh, video of how 3D printing is done. That house is constructed in 23 hours, the basic structure. The inside, the decorations and the um, putting fittings together is done by humans still. But imagine making a house in 23 hours, just the basic structure. And when we had this unfortunate Fani in the eastern part of the country, and thank God we didn't have much loss of life, Imagine those are technology, how much impact it can have on society. Or if you want to set up a factory, and I was involved in Unilever for setting up two factories, and the project office would be there forever and ever. And by the time the factory comes up, 
um, one would wonder whether one would retire there. It is not only that. 3D printing getting application into small things. Now, at the end of the day, when a technology like this comes in, many of us are under the notion that this will not affect me. It's too far off. And that is a complacency that sets in our mind. That perhaps I will not be affected. My organization is too much different industry or too safe in its cocoon that we are not going to be affected. And we stay quietly. It's almost like putting your head in the sand and hoping the storm will pass through. And that is where the speed and the suddenness combination that I thought of what to share makes a big difference. Uh, you look at robotics. and um, in, a, in a plant in Chennai, in a car plant in Chennai, I saw the entire painting work of automobile body done by robotics. And if you remember, Praveer, there were about 15, 20 people with multiple lights in their paint shop. Uh, and the skill was a human eye. It should be able to uh, detect the slightest uh, wave in the paint or uh, not applied uniformly. And now the cameras and robotics say, your eyes are not reliable. I'm more reliable. And data shows that. Data shows that the paint rejection in that company has gone down by 15 to 17%. 15% rejection because of paint means a lot of money for an organization. Because at the end of the day, when the paint is rejected, the car has to be repainted again. It cannot be done touch up and all. Just one example. But at the, when you look at that, and with the reduced cost and spreading fast, now, Many organizations are looking at this afresh. I spent half my career with Unilever, very traditional, <laughs> you'll bear with me. And one, one of my avatar was head of recruitment. Recruitment in Hindustan Lever, at that time in India, I was called Hindustan Lever in Lipton, was the sacrosanct job of senior leaders. We could not hire a management trainee without two vice presidents being present in the board. And every five weeks, the chairman himself would spend one full day recruiting. Why? Because the company's philosophy was recruitment cannot be delegated, period. It's the job of a leader to identify leaders, future leaders. Now, why I'm giving this story? Such a strong belief in human judgment about recruitment. In November, I was in Blackfriars uh, headquarters in London, uh, Unilever, and I met a girl called Susan Braithwaite. Susan Braithwaite had come there after being interviewed three times, and it was the fourth connection with Unilever, but her first connection with human beings in Unilever. She had gone to three rounds of interviews on video calls. One of them was where 26 points in her face were monitored for muscle twitch, tightening, dilation of pupils, movement of lips, eyes, corner of eyes, and this data was then compared with 165,000, and I'm talking figures which are, which are um, really are surprising me, of the similar people who have gone through interviews and they verified whether there is authenticity or not. And after she passed through that test, was she called to Unilever House to meet the first human being. That meeting was hardly about 15, 20 minutes. They gave her an offer. Of course, she was being hired as an intern. Look at the distance. What I'm making out, pointing out here is that even traditional companies, we thought that this was our USP. We, this cannot be sacrificed. This is written in stone. They are also recognizing that times have changed. And with that time, if we don't change, we'll be left behind. And this is a very strong feeling in, in my mind that if Unilever can let go recruitment judgment to machines, we can see a lot of things happening somewhere else uh, much faster also. Uh, Now, with this type of technology coming in, one thing that is evidently happening is that the cost of production, manufacturing has gone down. So when we could talk about this Chinese product invading our market, we are being actually short-sighted. Why are they invading market? I bought a bicycle the other day from Decathlon. Do you have De uh, Decathlon everywhere or is it only here? It doesn't matter. And I paid how much? About... 15,000 for that. 
uh, seven gears, not that I know how to use those seven gears, but I thought it was a very sexy bike and good for exercising. Same bike, with little less gears and all, was about 3,500 made in China. And I said, what an idiot. Why would I buy a 15,000 ka bike? Because it was the same function, going from point A to B, or to exercise. Why would Chinese have a better upper hand on all of us and other countries? Only one thing. They've used a high level of technology. And it's misnomer to think that China has high labor uh, intensity, so they are making... Ch they are not working on cost arbitrage. They are working on volume arbitrage. And volume arbitrage can only happen when you have technology on your side. So the speed is making a big impact. Let me move to the suddenness part of it. At one time, all of us have gone through incremental improvement in everything that we do. And it's a routine thing to happen. Things are working, somebody does a tweaking a little bit, a little bit of tuk-tak here, and things work better, productivity goes up, production goes up, quality improves, rejection goes down. And this we have seen for years. What is now happening is that instead of incremental improvement, an inflection improvement is happening. Suddenly, there is a sharp jump. If you remember the old book um, in the 70s, um, In Search of Excellence, there Tom Peters and company gave examples of how some companies were working, okay, all right, up, all right, and suddenly they went up. Same thing is happening to products and services. The inflection point makes a big difference in big boys and big girls and not so big boys and big girls in industry. With that inflection, the whole game changes. Tesla has come up with a car which is actually 16 moving parts. And I'm told by my friends in Maruti that a normal car, including bolts and nuts and washers, has 23,600 some odd parts. And Tesla gives lifetime warranty. Some new place on the places, 16 parts. I'm not going into this driverless car. There will be a new technology which will bring about a complete change in the way we we'll use some of the products that we used to. I'm not even going about owning a car anymore. Services that Uber and uh, Ola's offer, and there is, I met a gentleman, Sahil. Where is Sahil sitting from Zomato? Where is Sahil gone? Okay, I met him in the lift and we're talking about how Zomato does it. He has 165,000 employees of only 4,800 hours on his payroll. The delivery people are not even covered for anything. No cost, no liability, nothing for the company. And we sometimes think in our own socialistic pattern of thinking, but they are left on the road. What if they meet with an accident? Those were the thinking of the past. When you talk of tomorrow, things will be thought differently. I'm not giving any value judgment whether it's right or wrong. Please, um, Make that. I'm not saying that is the right thing to do, but it is happening in reality. 150,000 minus 4,000 people, they are all on the road on their own motorcycles, on risk of injury, but still managing to earn and deliver in 30, 35 minutes a product or a service. Watson, I spent a good amount of years with IBM, and at one time I was involved in the project team internationally on working on predictive attrition. I felt squeamish coming from experience of being touched with the pulse of the people, finding out what makes them tick, what doesn't make them tick, what makes them stay. It was at one time uncomfortable to think that a machine will tell us who will go. What will we do then? Where is our mind going to be occupied? But the predictability is so accurate, and IBM now uses it. The predictability is so accurate that last week, I met Ginny Rometty, she was in it, not last week, last month, and she mentioned that IBM had saved 300 million US dollars in 2018 for controlling attrition. Now that's big impact on business. At the end of the day, these are not sexy things that we do, which looks very modern. If we don't do it, we are in Jurassic Park. This is all running a business efficiently. And HR people have to understand that we just don't do it because it's fancy, it's novelty. This is imperative. How many of us have been aware what type of technology 
will come in my industry and what in, uh, proactive actions I have to take. Come to the last part of security of jobs. <coughs> I'll be on time. I'm keeping track. Uh, I don't think this hawa about uh, jobs will be lost. If you go back to 70s, and I was starting my career in early 70s, the unions were ferociously opposing computerization. Why? Because there was a strong belief that computers will replace jobs or reduce jobs. And it took us years, if not too many years, but some years, to convince that at least this will facilitate work. No jobs were lost, jobs were replaced. And today, you ask the same union leader to work one week without a computer and the union will go on a strike. Why? How can we work without a computer? The first resistance, wave of resistance, is what we get scared with that this will not sell. It will sell. If it doesn't sell, we have to sell. Period. The survival organization is absolutely overriding any other considerations, union, employees, I'm not saying sacrifice employees' interests, but the convincing part and the logical part has to be played a role by the HR people. Uh, Gartner report, which came out I think in January or February, talked about a very nice table of 231 jobs that will be obsolete, they will be disappeared. In fact of that they say some 70, 80 have already gone. Any job which is predictable, repetitive, will not exist. Logical. Machine can do the same thing. But there's no threat to jobs because people who will come out of that slot can be retrained, reskilled to do something else. And surprisingly, in that same list, there were some 50 odd jobs that will continue. And one job which amused me was customer relations. Logic. You can't have, I wouldn't like, to, if I'm irritated about this machine, to go to a robo and say, good, you bought a nice machine, oh, it's not working, it will work, press one for working, press two for not working. I want a human interaction. And where there is judgment and there is discretion, those jobs will continue. So the, the answer in security of job lies in just shifting the panel from repetitive jobs, boring jobs at times, causes attrition and unhappy workplace to make them do some work which is discretionary and thinking. And that itself will bring about a productivity increase and production increase and improvement in the organization. Logically, it should. But how do we do this transition? And that's where <coughs> the whole idea of adapt and the gentleman who inaugurated use that word adapt and adopt will instead of resisting, will have to adapt and adopt this technology to make sure that we are in line with the future and not lagging behind just because we seem to feel that what we have done is always right. Last part. So at the end of the day, how do we deal with it? I look at it two points. One, dealing is done by organization for preparing for the future. Second, as an individual, the organization will have to invest heavily in reskilling and retraining people. There's no option for that. However, the costly it is. So I read somewhere a small uh, thing that the CFO advising CEO that so why do we spend so much money on training and developing people? At the end of the day, they leave and their competition believes uh, benefits. And the CEO, who was possibly an ex HR guy, <laughs> said that it will be a disaster if we don't train them and they stay with us. And that's the important part. This is not a optional cost anymore. It is a business imperative cost and it was built into business plan because at the end of the day it is only a matter of time that the workforce will become obsolete and if the workforce is obsolete the business will get negatively impacted period. There is no brainer about that. And other part is that we have to proactively make sure that we bring about this preparedness in the organization. The organization are proactive. Most of the time when something happens in industry or in technology brings about a tectonic plate movement, then people wake up and say, now what do we do? Well, one cannot predict everything, but understanding business thoroughly, which many of us in HR are accused of, we don't understand. We understand PBT, PAT, CHGR to the last decimal point, but what makes a business leader lose his or her sleep is something that eludes us. 
we'll have to make sure that we understand business, the competition, absolutely thoroughly so that we are able to advise business as to how we should be preparing ourselves. It works. So two minutes to go. <laughs> now how do you switch it off? Yeah. <clears throat> As an individual, I feel renewal our skill is absolutely no option. We get scared when we talk of things and we do not know. Sometimes when we talk of how many of us can raise our hand and say you can explain blockchain clearly to an 11 year old child. Except Prabir, you are an expert sir. Maybe you should ask Prabir to explain to us. I am serious about it. We hear all these words and we talk about them, we hear people speak about that and say, yes, I know, blockchain is on the way. Oh, artificial intelligence, yes, it's on the way. How many of us really know? Now, that fear made me go and attend a, a full two-day workshop on data analytics. And they talked about Python. I'm a very keen wildlife photographer. And to me, Python was a big snake. <laughs> Did not know it was the software that ran this. And then they showed this movie called Moneyball. Anybody seen that? And how this baseball team uses data to reduce cost of buying players and winning. Never thought game was played by people sitting on a computer. If Virat Kohli was playing well, he was chosen in the team. At least I thought that. But the Indian team last year used the same data analysis for picking players. Sitting through that was an eye-opener for me. I, I, I enrolled myself <laughs> quite some time back on uh, 3D printing. I was intrigued. I said, what does 3D printing do? So I went to Coursera and did a three months uh, um, study on, not that I would understand half of it, I'm not a technical person, but the fact that even ice cream can be made by 3D printing, by putting it together and then bombarding it with nitrogen, what it opens your eyes is when you have to learn something new, there is a method of approaching it rather than leaving it to chance and hoping you will pick up or hoping that the organization will prepare you. They will not. And if we are to be left behind, we have to just feel sorry for ourselves because we have not contributed to learning journey. And, and one of the good ways possibly to learn is not only reading, but I would leave one thought behind which has benefited me is to get a reverse mentor. Tag on to some youngster, make life miserable for them to teach you. And it really works wonders. So my last point would be that change is there, it was always there, so no VUCA. Change is fast, yes, it is fast, it is very sudden. And technology is moving so quickly that many of us are obsolete already and we do not know. The whole idea is to actually embrace change and most important, in my opinion, enjoy change. It's like when you go for a holiday to a different place and try to do new food, you've not got experience of that, but you say, I'll try that, go to that place, try this food. And if we look at change of technology happening around us with an anticipation that I will enjoy it, although I don't understand head or tail of it, I will learn. It will make a big difference. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please, one minute. Please stay one minute. So friends, I think that was a perfect choice for the topic New Age Traits of Agile HR Leaders. From the way he spoke, I think he has a very agile mind. I'd like to request Mr. Sanjay Gupta, Chief Architect and Member Governing Council Shared Services Forum to please come up and give a memento to Dr. Akhil Batray. If you didn't hear Sanjay, he said it was mesmerizing.